welcome everyone. My name is Sochita Cheng. I am a TA at LSAT and Plex Prep course, and I've been a course member for a little over a year now. Um, and this evening, I'm happy to be joined by our guest, Nicole Miller from Washington University of Law in St. Louis. Um, so let me just give you a brief introduction about Nicole. So Nicole is a second year law student um, at WashU Law. She um, received a Washington Award Dean's Fellowship for Merit-Based Full Tuition Scholarship. Um, Nicole has quite an impressive background. Um, not only that she is a significant member at WashU Law, she is also a member of the National Mood Court. Um, she received Excellency in Oral Advocacy Award. Um, and won multiple outstanding attorney awards for best performances in public speaking and argumentation in courtrooms. So welcome, Nicole. Um, thank you so much for being here. Why don't you go ahead and tell us a little bit more about yourself and your areas of focus in law school and why law is a career? Yeah, well, thanks so much for having me. Uh, it's a joy to be here. I've partnered with LSAT Unplugged before. Um, a little bit about me on top of what you already said, which thank you very much for the nice introduction, is that, um, you know, as you said, I'm a second year law student. I'm actually taking my last exam of my second year tomorrow. And my focus throughout law school has been uh, criminal prosecution. So this last semester, I was in the prosecution clinic last summer. And this summer, I'm doing a prosecution internship that is the reason that I'm in law school, because you kind of have to be in order to be a prosecutor. Um, so that's been my focus the whole time. Another big component of my experience in law school has been my YouTube channel called Life as a Law Student. Uh, so if anybody wants more advice on specific topics, including the LSAT, you are welcome over there. Uh, I have, I think, like 130 videos or something on every single topic I could think of and continue to think of as I go through law school. Wow. Um, wow. Just clinics. I, I have so many questions about that. Um, just, just, you know, I, I'm just curious to see, like, did you know that you always wanted to go to law school during undergrad or before that? Yeah, I grew up with the very typical, like, parents who always said, oh, she's going to be a lawyer because I argued all the time. Um, and I always liked that idea of being the arbitrator of justice and figuring out what was fair, but I really knew that law school was going to be my direction the sophomore year of high school because I joined the mock trial team um, for my school and was placed as a prosecutor for the team. And within the first week, I was like, people can get paid <laughs> to do this. This is so fun. Uh, I loved going into the courtrooms. We were judged by actual sitting judges and attorneys. And the feedback I got from them was just invaluable. I really felt at home in the courtroom. I loved every opportunity for public speaking I could get, which don't worry if you want to be a lawyer and don't want to public speak. There are lots of lawyers who don't do that, but uh, I really liked it. And I always found criminal law to be really fascinating too. So it started when I was in high school, but then by the time I got to college and now law school, there are a lot of other elements of the criminal justice system that I'm just really passionate about. And it turns out to be an area where my passion, interests and skills, I'd like to think all intersect. Wow, and, and, and dedication, I would add. Um, you And you know so early on, that's very, very cool. Um, so, you know, let's let's talk a little bit about your law school applications, you know, such as LSAT, law school resume and more, um, you know, for what, have land, you know, got you into WashU Law. When did you start studying for the LSAT and how was that experience like for you? So I graduated college in December of 2018. So I think I started studying for the LSAT January 2018. So it would have been the middle of my junior year in college. Um, I took the LSAT that next June, like right at the beginning. So I technically had a total of five months of studying, but I really was barely studying at all. I studied a little bit in January, a little bit in February, basically none in March, and then <laughs> picked it up at the end of April and went really hard all the way through May. So you can call that what you will. I would say it averages out to about three months of studying. And that was probably 
not as much as I should have done in retrospect, but it was enough for me to meet my goal. So if I had studied as much as I should have and focused more on especially reading comprehension, I like didn't even study that at all. I was like, I know how to read. Um, if I had studied that more, I probably could have gotten an even higher score than I did. But I knew that to go to the kind of school that I wanted to and get a good scholarship um, and to be you know, on the path that I had already carved out for myself, I needed to get basically 167, 168 or higher. And I really didn't like studying for the LSAT. So if I could get that on my first try, I wasn't gonna like come try again. So I took the LSAT in June, got a 169 and was like, cool, that is good enough for me. I uh, didn't have to take it again. So that was awesome. Amazing score, 169, wow. And you know, yeah, and just the three months that you study, you know, there's people who have studied so much longer. And I know reading comprehension is, is not, it's not, it's very, very different, you know, to other component, uh, but it's definitely improvable for sure. Um, I'm right now just, you know, just trying to um, learn more about reading comprehension and, you know, put more effort into that. Um, and I, I'm just curious because we do have, you know, we have a YouTube, we have, Steve has um, so many blogs that he put up, um, podcasts. How did you find LSAT Unplugged and how it, how did it play a role in your LSAT prep? Yeah, so I just kind of Googled LSAT prep, help me. <laughs> I, I had no idea what to do. I didn't have any friends who were going to law school. None of the people in my family uh, are lawyers. So I was figuring it all out as I went, which is why I made a YouTube channel. Cause I was like, there's gotta be other people like me who just need a little help <laughs> trying to figure out how to get started. Um, but yeah, I was just Googling it and his blog came up. So I didn't even know about the podcast or the YouTube channel. I, I don't know how developed they were at the time. They could have been fully developed. I didn't know. I didn't find them. But I found his website and um, some of the free like cheat sheets and practice exams and practice questions. Um, and that really supplemented my studying along with what I primarily used, which were the power score Bibles. Okay, wow. Um, yeah, so so just using the free stuff and studying for three months, you were able to to get a 169. That's very, very impressive. Um, I'm so jealous right now, but <laughs> we'll talk about that later. Um, so, wow. So, yeah. Okay, let's just talk about your law school resume, right? So now that you have a law student, you've been in law school, um, is there any tips or things to avoid for future applicants um, to write their resume? Okay, so on your resume, things that you, let me start with, should definitely include um, are things that make you unique, one, and things that show a clear interest in law, <laughs> two. Um, and those don't have to overlap necessarily. Law schools know that the people applying to them want to go to law school. So it's great if you've done an internship with the district attorney, if you I don't know, have a, a connection or a personal reference who can write you a letter who's a lawyer. That's awesome. Like definitely include that. Um, but if you are on the dance team or you were in the theater or you were a math major, you know, talk about that stuff too, because that makes you stand out from other applicants. Um, include it on your resume, but more importantly, I would make sure that you include that in any interviews you do with the law school and on your personal statement in some capacity, which I think we're going to talk about later. Um, things that you should avoid on your resume are things that are just like totally unrelated. Like this doesn't, something I learned way later in life <laughs> that I should have is that your resume is not a complete work history. We don't care about the summer that you were babysitting four years ago. Like that's not, unless that is influencing why you became an elementary education major, it doesn't need to be on your resume. Um, so a resume is just focused on the qualities that are gonna make you stand out to whatever you're applying to. So in the case of law school, things that show an interest in law and things that make you unique. Kind of tell a little bit of a story, make a list of who you are as a person, not just you know the random job that you had at Office Depot or something. <laughs> 
Yeah, that is so interesting to hear um, because I know, um, you know, there's certain perspectives on like interest there. There's that, that interest like, um, you know, at the bottom of your resume, you know, from, for, for different um, like law school resume. But there are some people who are saying not to put your interest because people don't care about whether you like cooking because it's very you know, generic or basic, right? But um, there's also other people who like, okay, show that you, you know, your interest in skiing, like in a certain area of the country, right? right. Um, yeah, and also from what I hear is that basically not just list every job that you've ever had, because I guess ever, you know, in college, you probably work a lot just, you know, for different aspects of like finances or, you know, or just have a lot of, have some time. Um, so not to like basically list everything that you work, um, just clarifying that basically your interest in law school and I guess how you are as an applicant, like, you know, I guess they want to see sort of like, um, a theme on your resume, would you say? Yeah, I think that's a really good way of thinking about it. And, you know, like you're saying, no matter what you do, you're not going to please everybody always, there's going to be personal preferences involved, but at least at Wash U, they like, if you don't have an interest at the bottom of your resume, they'll put one there for you. So at least for Wash U, like they want to see that. They want to see what makes you different from everybody else who's applying. Um, and I think that's more and more true at the higher level of school that you're applying to, because you get to a point, not that I got into any Ivy League schools, but if you're applying to one of those, everybody's smart, right? Like we, we got that covered. Um, what, what are you interested in? Like, who are you as a person? What diverse perspective are you going to bring? Even if you're like me and I have no diversity in my uh, family or blood. So my diversity has to come from my interests and, you know, the perspective I'm going to bring to a classroom. Um, that's one of the reasons that I talked a lot about uh, my religious background and how I went to a faith-based school that really influenced my worldview and influenced who I was going to be as a student in the WashU classroom. Um, so that's something that I talked about and I think helped differentiate me from a lot of other candidates. That, that is an excellent response. I know, you know, um, a lot of us who have no idea like what direction to go, whether to put the interest or not, but thank you so much for clarifying that. Um, and and you, you're so right because like, you know, you 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 show this on your resume, you work, you go to school, you this, but what, what are the things that you do besides all of that? You know, who are you as a person? And yeah, that, that's such an excellent response. Um, so in your other in interviews, um, you've talked about your personal statement. Um, for, for those who, who um, don't know, how many people have looked at um, your personal statement um, and how did you come to finalize the topic that you want to write about? Yeah, those are, those are hard. <laughs> personal statements are really difficult. Um, and looking back on mine, I could have done a much better job than I did. But I think the thing that I did well was exactly what you're alluding to in your question is I kind of brainstormed a short list of topics that I was like, maybe I could talk about this. I can think of a story that I can relate to my interest in law here. And I sent it out to my friends and family. I was like, what do you think? And a lot of them were like, this is stupid. Like this doesn't teach me anything about you, Nicole, or why you want to be a lawyer. Um, and so what I settled on, as I mentioned before, was talking about my faith background and how that influenced the way that I think about law and the world more generally, how it influenced me wanting to become a lawyer. Um, the thing that I could have done a lot better was tell an actual story instead of just describing myself. Um, and now through my YouTube channel and my website, I actually offer personal statement reviews um, to people, whether they're subscribers or whatever, just anyone who finds me. Um, I will read their personal statements. I will give them feedback, not only on grammar and sentence structure, but on the tone of their essay. And if they're telling a narrative that's compelling and explaining who they are as a person, it's great if you can talk about how that story relates to why you want to be a lawyer, but it's not necessary in a lot of cases. Um, I've read a lot of personal statements where people talk about their work experience um, and what they've done in the 10 years between college and law school. I've read some about people who moved as children or whose parents were immigrants and 
um, how that influenced them going into college and trying to develop, sorry, that was my phone, <laughs> trying to develop a work ethic for themselves. Um, so it's really finding a topic, and it might take a couple tries, that encapsulates a, a major part of who you are. Um, this is really helpful if you have a school who doesn't do interviews as part of the application. This is their one chance to hear from you. You know, your LSAT is a number. Your GPA is a number. Your resume is like a bullet point list, right? Your um, personal statement is a chance to just talk about what's important to you, who you are, why you want to be in law school, what you're going to bring to the legal field. It's probably... I don't want to say the most important part of your application, but maybe the part of your application that could swing you from a no to, the, uh, to a yes more than anything else. Um, I've heard, I'm going to turn this off. I'm so sorry. <laughs> um, I've heard actual stories from people who had GPAs and LSATs just absolutely at the bottom of the chain who got super great scholarships because of their personal statements. I don't know this for sure. I think my personal statement has much improvement as it could have used is probably what got me a full ride scholarship or at least contributed to it because people got to see who I was as a person and beyond the numbers, which especially at a top ranked school are gonna be the same as everybody else's. Um, my numbers as great as they were, I think, <laughs> I had a 3.9 GPA and a 169 LSAT. That's average at WashU. That's not top 10%. I'm like in the middle. So having a personal statement and an interview and a resume that set me apart and gave me a unique perspective from my religious background to my interest in being a prosecutor, that's what got me the scholarship. I mean, it has to be because my number certainly didn't do it. Uh, that's a really long-winded answer, but I just think that personal statements are really undervalued and underestimated. The power of a personal statement is amazing. If you're investing money, as I'm assuming all the people watching this video are, in improving your LSAT score, you should be investing money and time in improving your personal statement because it can do just as much um, as far as getting scholarship offers and getting admissions. Those are such great advice. I, I, I have to go back and look at my personal statement again. And I just feel like there's so much work now that I, now that I've talked to you and you just explain a great deal. Um, wow. Okay. So it's, it, yeah. So it basically gave you like a chance um, of, you know, describing yourself from, you know, apart from your resume and all the numbers. Um, and that's so interesting to hear that you, you have um, send out your first topic and then everybody just kind of give their opinion and then that's yeah. how you come to like your your you know the the top topic that you ultimately went with um so what you you know you mentioned actual stories is like examples um of like you know more descriptive in terms of personal resume a uh, personal statement I'm sorry or um I don't know because there's people you know People write very different personal statement. I've read there's one very descriptive um, and there are ones just like straight to the point. Mm -hmm. What's your take on that? I think personally, and I've, I've read a lot doing these reviews. I've easily read over a hundred personal statements. Um, I, the ones that stand out in my mind that I still remember a year or two later, which is really what you're going for, are the ones that have the most detail that's relevant and in the shortest amount of space. <laughs> so that's why I think having an editor or a reviewer, whether you're paying somebody like me or you're just giving it to your mom or whoever it is, you want somebody who's going to be really honest with you and say, this whole paragraph, not necessary, but that detail, I wanna hear more about that. Um, and then really whittle it down to, to those like really poignant parts of your statement. You know, for example, I don't need a paragraph on your day to day life in the company you spent 10 years at. I want to know why aren't you there anymore? Like, what triggered your transition from that company to wanting to go to law school? I don't really care about the numbers and the data of, you know, what's something that's on your resume. That's another thing, too. If it's on your resume, you don't need to like detail it out again. You know, you only have most of the time two pages, you know, that's going to be the only picture the admissions office has as you as a person. 
So don't waste it. Don't waste it on what they already know. Don't waste it on details that have nothing to do with who you are as a person or just something that you did. Uh, we don't really care about what you did. We care about why you did it and what that says about you more generally. Thank you so much for clarifying that. Um, I'm gonna need more detail uh, because I still have personal statement. Um, maybe you could give me a little tip and help. Yeah. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, so, you know, Wash U Law, top 16th um, best law schools in the US according to US News. Um, can you walk us through um, a little bit about your decision making in terms of um, choosing Wash U Law? Sure. So I'll be perfectly honest and then I'll give a more generally applicable answer. Uh, for me, it really came down to the money because I was so blessed and lucky to have really great offers from a lot of really great schools. Um, and then WashU gave me a lot more money <laughs> than all the other really good offers. So it became easy when a top, at the time, just top 20, I think we were, I think we were the like number 19 or something. We've jumped up a couple spots in the last two years. Um, just great for me. I'm like, I'm happy. Keep going, WashU. <laughs> uh, makes me look better. But um, at the time, like top 20-ish uh, law school, uh, was giving me not only a full ride, but then eventually also offered a living stipend on top of that and a guaranteed clinic experience and a set up mentorship. You know, it was just like all these things. And they really showed a lot of interest in me as an applicant, um, knowing what my personal interests were and what was important to me. And then giving me ways, even before I had said that I was going to go <laughs> to make those dreams happen. Um, so that meant a lot to me. I fully understand that not everybody has the opportunity to decide between a bunch of full ride offers. <laughs> so if money isn't the easy deciding factor for you, other things that I think are important um, are one environment and community. It's been a little hard the last year of not being able to visit schools. I don't know how I would have done that. Um, if you can visit a school, you really, really should. Um, it makes a big difference. There was one school, I don't want to like call them out, so I won't say which one it was, but I went to one school and I drove like three hours to get there. And I was, I got on campus. I was like, I don't like it. I don't like it here at all. I don't want to spend three years in this place. It just felt so dead. There weren't any windows anywhere. It was just like a basement library, cubicles, like never ending. And like, this looks like a dungeon where law students come to die. And I'm not interested in studying here for three years. So I think that's pretty important to make sure that you're in an environment that you feel comfortable in. You're gonna spend a lot of time in the library. Make sure it's a library that you like. Um, money obviously is great. Whoever's giving you the most money isn't necessarily the right option, but certainly don't you know spit on them. Like <laughs> consider it, um, money is a big deal when you graduate, especially depending on what kind of job you're going into, how competitive that field is, et cetera. Um, I think that practical experience is super important too. Um, that was one thing I was looking for. Washington University was in the top five clinical programs of the United States at the time. I don't know where it is now, but we have like over 15 clinics and externships that people can do, including three in criminal law, which is pretty rare. Most of the schools I was looking at didn't have anything in criminal law. If they did, it was with the public defender's office, which is great, but it's not what I wanted to do. Um, so the fact that we had a prosecutor's office, an externship with the DOJ, public defender's office, wrongful conviction clinic, and innocence, pro like we had five <laughs> that were all things I'd be interested in doing. Um, that is super important. And WashU guarantees that every student will be able to get one. Uh, WashU also has stuff like a semester in practice where you can spend a semester just doing an internship, you don't have to go to class. Like that was really appealing to me. You could do a semester abroad, um, like study abroad, but for law school, that's awesome. Um, so it's really like looking at what that school is gonna offer you, what they're going to guarantee you, <laughs> and then kind of how they treat their students, which I think is pretty evident in the admissions process as well. Uh, another one other thing to consider, which kind of goes hand in hand with visiting is the location of the school. So if you are from Kansas and you want to stay in Kansas, you have no interest in living anywhere else, you don't need to go to Harvard, go to school in Kansas. Uh, you'll probably get more money 
And then you can reach your goal. You know, go to the school that's going to meet your goals while costing you the least amount of money. Uh, I think that that's great advice generally. If you aren't looking to go to just a regional school, you want to have a broader reach, you're trying to go to top ranked school, it still kind of matters. You're going to spend three years in whatever city you're in. St. Louis is not my favorite city, to be honest with you, but that was the only downside of Wash U for me. So that ended up not being controlling, but if I didn't have the offer that I did from Wash U, I probably would have picked, actually my second choice was Notre Dame, which was in a city I liked a lot better. So I don't know, even know what I just said. Money, location, school environment, how they treat you during admissions, practical experience, and other educational opportunities. These are all things that I think are important. They may be more or less important to you depending on where you're going, what your financial background is, why you're in law school. Um, but I think that they're all worth considering even if you weigh them differently. Wow, so they were like, I want Nicole. <laughs> I'm gonna offer her everything that she likes, prostitutes, yep. <laughs> clinics, the living situation. Wow. Um, I was like, I will take it. I understand. <laughs> WashU has a reputation of the by statistics because the higher ranked students you have, you know, the higher ranked school you have. Uh, I was happy to sell my statistics to WashU. I'm like, highest bidder is getting the win um, because they were all giving me a lot of money. I mean, if you have the option to do that, if you have the option to graduate with no debt from law school, you need a really good reason to not pick that school. It's a, it's a pretty significant factor. That, that is absolutely true. That is, I feel like it's a no brainer, you know, going graduate with no debt and, um, and, and just, yeah, and going to law school for the three years. Um, so I, I uh, you know, and I also would say that LSAT will probably play a bigger role in that personal statement that you just mentioned. And, um, law school resume and I guess how you are um, as an applicant, right? That, that, you know, your applications that you put into. Um, I just want to pick point because you mentioned something about internship. You can do internship um, at Wash U without going to class. That sounds so cool. Can you elaborate more on that? Yeah, I didn't even know that this was a thing before I was at Wash U, but I was asking someone in the Career Center. We have a great Career Center, by the way, that's another factor too. Look at the Career Center and how they interact with students. Um, I was talking with them about maybe wanting to do a public defender internship just to kind of get both perspectives, even though I know I want to be a prosecutor. And they directed me to talk with a student who had done an internship with a public defender, uh, but during a semester, like in the fall or the spring of his second year. And I was like, what do you mean he did it in this, during the semester? Like, how do you, because this is before the virtual classes, you can't do both. Like, and he was doing the internship in North Carolina. Um, I'm like, how do you do that? And they said semester in practice. I'm like, tell me more. And basically you get 12 credits, which is the minimum that you need to be enrolled during a semester just for doing an internship like you would over the summer. So if you're unfamiliar, law students over the summer almost always have a internship, uh, usually like eight to 12 weeks or so. And that's what you spend your summer doing. Um, unless you're in public interest, you usually get paid. If you're doing what I do, you usually don't get paid, um, but your school might give you a stipend. And over the semester, I would assume that you're just taking classes, but WashU has a program where you can just do the internship like you would over the summer, over the semester for class credit. I'm like, why isn't everybody doing, I would so much rather be in an office pretending to be a lawyer <laughs> than being in class. Like that's like a no brainer to me. Um, so yeah, the only like downside is that you have to take, you know, a couple extra credits a different semester to make up for it, to graduate on time. Uh, so I worked really hard my second year. I took a lot of credits so that next semester and next spring semester when I'm doing my semester in practice, I only have to take 12. Oh, wow. Um, that is, that just sounds like yes to me, you know, internship yeah. and not go to class and pretend to be a lawyer. Don't we all? Um, <laughs> once in a while, pretending to be a lawyer, right? Um, 
that is so cool because you get I'm, I feel like I don't know how early probably not 1L probably not first year you probably can or cannot right. I'm not sure uh, but yeah. maybe like, oh okay sorry I didn't even interrupt you um <laughs> I just say your first year pretty much at I want to say every law school I'm going to totally get like dinged for like one who's an exception but pretty much every law school your first year classes are already set for you you're going to take legal research and writing contracts torts property con law crim law and civil procedure that's what everybody takes their first year maybe like one or two classes are different but pretty much everybody that's what you're going to take your second and third year for the most part are totally elective you get to choose what classes you're taking so if i just choose to take a bunch of classes my second year then my third year which is my plan covid pending uh is to do study abroad in the fall and semester and practice in the spring so i wouldn't be in any classes at wash u next year at all um but again i don't know how the fall is going to go we'll see <laughs> Yeah, so uh, let's talk about that. From your experience, right? How, what are the differences um, between, you know, law school environment and college environment? Um, and I, I guess also 1L and 2L, right? And in terms of the preparation. Okay, so college, you have a greater variety in work. Your projects might be speeches or presentations or a test or a quiz or an exam or a paper or a poster. I had to do a poster for a class. Um, you know, you just, you have all kinds of different things that you're doing. You know, you have your English class, you have to read 50 pages for the night, and then you have to write a paper for your communication class, and you have to prepare a play for your theater class. I don't know. I just, this is like my last semester in college. I don't remember all my other classes. Um, but you're doing a bunch of different kind of things. In law school, you're just doing a lot of the same thing, which is reading cases. That's all your homework, at least for the first year. Um, it changes a little bit your second and third year, but not by a lot. You're usually just reading. And it's really hard <laughs> your first year. No matter how smart you are, no matter how great you did in college, you're kind of weird if you don't think that 1L is incredibly difficult because you're not just learning a bunch of new things about the law in four to six different areas that you've never studied before, but you're also learning how to learn about them in a different way than you've ever learned anything before, because you're learning to read cases, analyze them, and talk about them, not just about what happened, but how you would apply what happened to a totally different set of facts. So that analytical process is what lawyers do. It's a common saying to say that law school doesn't teach you about the law. It teaches you how to think like a lawyer. It's really cliche, but it's totally true. I don't know anything about the law. Like, don't ask me any legal questions. I don't know the answer. Um, but I know how to analyze a fact pattern. So it's really different because law school, you have just a lot of the same thing. And that thing gets really boring and it's really hard. <laughs> and sometimes you just don't wanna read cases. Whereas college, if you didn't like something, you could just move on to the other kind of project that you had to do. Um, so that's the big difference between college and law school. I don't know, depending on the college that you went to, it might be the same or more amount of work, but it's different kind of work. Um, and then 1L to 2L, really depends on what classes you're taking. So if you take more doctrinal classes, which is usually like a three credit class where the professor is lecturing a lot, you read a lot of cases, you get cold called, classes that are very similar to 1L, then your homework's gonna be really similar to 1L. Um, but you also might take seminars where your grade is more on class participation or short papers or one long research paper. So your upper, class years are an opportunity to kind of vary up your work a little bit, but they're not easy classes. You know, the, the diff more different the work, now you're like not used to it. That was a big thing for me this the last year. I was like, how do I give a speech again? How do I write a paper again? It's been a minute, you know, because I just had a, a whole year of just reading um, and not writing anything substantial. Um, so yeah, that's that can be hard too. Um, yeah, it's, it's a lot of work and it's a lot of different work and you have to do work in a different way. So it's difficult, but if you are feeling like it's difficult, you're definitely not the only one. It's difficult for everybody.
So, so from what I'm hearing is that 1L, <clears throat> they're kind of pick classes for you, right? So, you know, you just going with the classes like everyone else who, you know, are in their 1L. Um, how would one prepare for 1L? Um, because I have not gone to law school um, and I would really like to know if there's anything, you know, like that future applicants can do to prepare for that. Yeah, it's a tough question because no matter who you ask, you're probably going to get a different answer. I'm in the camp of you can't prepare for 1L <laughs> and you probably shouldn't. It's probably to your benefit to just not. Um, the only thing that I would say is maybe if you're in college and they have a class on like criminal procedure or civil procedure or whatever version of law, you're already going to take that in law school but it doesn't hurt to just be familiar with the process um, when your grade isn't so competitive. Uh, I did mock trial in high school and college, as I mentioned, that really helped a lot um, with criminal law and criminal procedure because I'd already practiced like doing a bunch of those arguments. So I think the best thing and really only thing you can do, which isn't gonna help you at all with being a law student, but might help you in a couple of the classes, is just be familiar with procedure so that not every term is unfamiliar to you. Um, the other thing I would say selfishly is watch videos of people in law school talking about law school. Uh, you don't have to watch my videos if you don't find me entertaining or helpful, but there are now a lot of law school YouTubers. Some of them focus more on like vlogs and kind of like entertainment lifestyle stuff with a little law school here and there that's great. I'm much more <laughs> what I'm doing now, uh, just kind of talking at the camera about different topics in law school. That's the kind of video that would have helped me. And there weren't a lot of now there's a little bit more. So I think just the more that you can learn the questions to be asking, uh, the better off you're going to be. But part of learning that is learning that you're just, you're not going to be prepared. <laughs> That's just part of it. Law school is kind of like a hazing for lawyers. So you're just going to come figure it out as you go um, and just be okay with not understanding everything the first time around because people who are going to law school are so smart. <laughs> like they're used to being at the top of their class. They're used to knowing what's going on and you're just not going to in law school and that's okay. Uh, so I think being comfortable with that is the best preparation you can can do. Um, set yourself up with a good support system of family and friends. That would be great. Um, maybe don't go to law school like I did at far away from everybody that you know. <laughs> uh, yeah, there's nothing you can do to learn to write better or read better. That's what law school is for. <laughs> don't go to law school before you're in law school. Um, but as far as just kind of setting yourself up for success so you don't have other things to worry about, that would be great. What you just said is so valuable. That's that's preparation for law school. Is I, I love the idea that, that like don't go to law school before going to law school. Um, that is such a cool advice because you know, like um for me, um, and I'm sure probably others as well, like the type A, like you like I'd like to be over prepared, you know. Um, like I'm like freaking out, law school, oh my gosh, I'm gonna start one L. But that is such a great advice. And and just familiar with the term and watch the video. I am definitely going, you know, to watch your video. Um, <laughs> life as a law student, right? Yeah. Um, yes, for sure. Because I'm also um like you, I, I would love to just um, have somebody talk to me and, you know, and tell me what it's like in law school. Um, and, and, you know, that will best prepare me um, for law school. Um, so you mentioned about homework. <laughs> I did not know that you do have homework in law school. Okay. I, I, well, it's kind of this cloudy, like where, people, you know, I've heard like, oh, you study all semester and you just take this one final. Mm -hmm. So I'm thinking like, okay, no homework, but it sounds, if it's no homework, it sounds like it's going to be a lot more work because you never know like whether what you like do is right, you know, how you study is right or right information. Um, can you tell us more about that? Yeah, so you do have homework. Um, it's just not graded. <laughs> so it's kind of like you better do it or you're really going to get a bad grade at the end. Um but your approach to it is going to be different, right? You don't have to, like, if you have five cases to read 
and you read four of them. You know, the next day, unless you get called on for that fifth case, <laughs> that might be embarrassing, but it's not going to do anything to your grade. What's going to happen to your grade is if there's a question on the exam related to that case that you never read three months ago. So law school is really just a, you know, every semester you're studying for one test and the homework is kind of chopping up the, the bits to study at a time. Uh, and then at the end, you kind of have to cram and remember the things you studied, you know, two to three months ago. Uh, but the whole time, that's the goal. So whatever you need to do to be prepared at the end, whatever that means for each individual day and week, like you do you. I think law school does have one thing right in that if they are going to test you that way, you have to do these chunks as they give them to you because after like two days, you're just never going to catch up because it's a lot of reading. And especially your first year, you have a lot of classes. So... I mean, it wasn't uncommon for me to be doing 150 pages of reading a night, which for cases is a lot. <laughs> uh, another thing I will say is you have more homework to do than is physically possible to do a lot of the times. So in cases like that, you need to have some kind of study strategy of, am I going to you know, use an online resource that summarizes cases for me? Am I going to just take really good class notes and not read it and hope that I don't get called on? Um, at the end of every week, am I gonna convert my written notes to a Word document and catch up on whatever reading I missed? You know, there are different strategies that work for different people. I've learned that you don't have to actually spend an hour reading every case, but you don't know that, you know, your first year. Your first year is to teach you like what works best for you. So now it takes me, 10 minutes to read a case that used to take me 60 because I know what I'm looking for. Um, but your first year, you're just not going to know that. So I would be as thorough and detailed your first year as you can be. Trust that you will figure it out. I It took me so much longer than I think it took a lot of people, but especially by your second year, you'll know. You'll know how to read a case. You'll know where the holding is, where the relevant reasoning is. And you'll know, I can skip all the jurisdiction and extra case law because it doesn't matter. It, I'm not going to be asked about that. It has nothing to do with what I'm learning for this class. Um, so hopefully your law school in orientation will give you a little bit of a sense of how to read a case, how to find relevant facts, but it's just going to take time and practice to figure out what works best for you in studying for that ultimate final exam. So you're basically, um, the minute you enter law school, that's the earliest you start preparing for finals. That's what yeah. I'm getting here. Pretty much. <laughs> so uh, you read 150 pages a case and a few cases to prepare before a class, before each class, I'm assuming. Yeah, well, not every case is 150 pages, thankfully. No, just that's kind of like a night kind of compiled for the classes I was reading for each day. Um, yeah, the cases might be anywhere from like one page to I've had a 50 page case before that sucks. I just didn't read that one, I'll be honest, but, um, yeah, it, it really just varies. Um, but you'll, you'll get a feel for it, you know, and hopefully your first week or two, the professors will like ease you in kind of help you along. Uh, but you are going to feel like you're drinking from a fire hydrant a lot of the time. Wow. So um, homework all throughout three years of law yeah. school. Oh, wow. And on top of like, say, second year, or are you doing the intern? Well, the internship, then you won't have classes, but <laughs> which is smart. I'm, 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 I'm taking mental notes. Um, that's a good thing to think about. Yes, no homework. Great. <laughs> well, well, internship, I guess, will they um, have finals still or no? No. So um, you, not every law school class necessarily has a final exam. All your first year uh, classes do, except for legal research and writing. Uh, those are papers, obviously. Um, but your second and third year, like I mentioned before, you might have a doctrinal class, but you also might have like a practicum or a seminar. So those might have a final paper. I had a class this year where it was just four short papers and we were done by finals. So nothing to do for that class or finals period. That was great. Internships you never, that I know of have finals. I don't know what they would test you on. Um, so the idea of a, a final exam is kind of to usually give you a fact pattern. You point out all the issues that you see relevant to what you learned in class. And then you apply the rules that you learned in class and you're reading 
uh, and the reasoning behind those rules to the new fact pattern in the exam and explain kind of what your outcome would be and why. Uh, so it's less memorization and more kind of what I talked about before is how to think like a lawyer in that particular topic. So if it's contracts, you need to know what a contract is. You need to know when there is and isn't a contract and what happens if somebody breaks that contract because you're gonna get a set of facts and you're gonna to have to go through each of those issues. Was this a contract? Why was it a contract? Did anyone breach it? Who breached it? How did they breach it? What do we do now that they breached it? Why do we do that? Um, that's kind of the, the process. So when you're studying, you're really trying to take in the reasoning, um, but it's less just straight up memorization. It, it might depend on your teacher, but as a general rule, you don't have to memorize a ton of stuff. It's more just how do you apply what you were supposed to be learning? Um, and in some classes, that's just not relevant, like an internship or a seminar when you're reading academic papers and, and writing them. Uh, you didn't necessarily learn anything to apply. You just started giving and forming your own opinions on things. Sounds very cool. It, it's a lot, but it also gets me excited about law school. Um, and a lot of reading, but um, you know, I hope there's there's other students and study group and you know helping each other out. Now that we're on the one L and two L, so you mentioned about two L being electives, right? Um, is there? I don't know if there um, isn't like an advisor, mentor who kind of help you. Um, like pick an area of interest, right? I don't know, because when you, you know, mentioned electives, I guess it's kind of, I've heard, um, you know, from other people, like so your second year is when like you're going towards what you want to do um, and how would one um, know that interest, right? Because I know, you know, people say they go to law school, they want to be, um, I don't know, a contract lawyer, but then ended up doing something completely different. How, how do, you know, how do we know, like, is there a way to find out, you know, um, kind of your interest and then anyone who help you picking those electives? Yeah, so the first thing that comes to mind is usually there's going to be a couple people at the law school who um, are helping with the career, you know, like the career center might give you advice. You can talk to different teachers who are in charge of subjects that you find interesting for advice. Uh, we have an academic advisor. We also have peer academic advisors who are pursuing internships or jobs in different areas. There's always mentoring opportunities and networking opportunities with other attorneys. So just talking with people on a very low level formality um, and no like stakes just to say like, hey, what do you do? <laughs> Why do you like it? Um, I think that's really helpful to do. That's something that people can do before they're in law school. I think it's great to come into law school with an idea of what you're interested in. I always tell people, like, do not go to law school if you don't have to go to law school. Um, I have to. Being a prosecutor is the only thing I've ever wanted to do. So I kind of have to go to law school to do that. Um, but if you have other interests that don't require a law degree, try those first. Uh, <laughs> if you're like, okay, I definitely want to be a lawyer. Here's what I like about the law. Um, and, and that interest feeds into criminal law, uh, and family law, for example, those are pretty related and have a lot of overlap, but you're like, I don't really know between the two, what I want to do talking with people. Great idea. Taking family law and taking criminal law. Great idea. Uh, doing internships or shadowing people in those jobs. Also great idea. Um, your second year, I would say that your second summer is kind of when you need to start having a formative idea, um, because you're going to take a job that very often can lead into your postgraduate job. And that not always, but usually is pretty determinative of the first big segment of your career, at least if it's going to be big law, corporate tax, property, wills, whatever it is. Uh, you're probably going to do it for a little while, <laughs> at least. Um, so your second job should probably reflect whatever you think your interest is mostly going to be. Um, but your first year, you know, gives you exposure to all those classes I said before, and that covers most areas of law, at least touches on them. So if you're really just not sure, your first year probably will give you a clue. Your second year and your first summer, you can kind of try out different classes and um, internships if you're not sure and then your second summer is kind of like 
all right, I figured it out. <laughs> or if you really like hate it, you need to figure it out really fast. <laughs> uh, you're kind of running out of time um, then. Not definitively, but you know, speaking generally. So I was really lucky and that I knew what I wanted to do. Not everybody's like that and it's okay, but I don't know. I feel bad like putting extra pressure on people going to law school, but like you kind of need to have a little bit of pressure um, because law school is expensive. It's a big investment of time and money, let alone mental health. Like uh, it's, it takes a lot, it takes a lot out of you. So you want to make sure that you're going to get something worthwhile out of it. Not just that's a paycheck, but something that's important to you um, that you are passionate about. So if you can, I would really encourage you to find something that you at least could see yourself sort of liking by the time that you go into law school. Thank you so much for that. <laughs> that is such an elaborate um, answer for this question. Uh, and I've just learned so much from, you know, um, from your experience as a, law, as a current law student. Um, so one L, yeah, you kind of have that summer to kind of, I guess, kind of intern at whatever you like and kind of see if you like that or not, or if you need to switch. Um, and you've mentioned, um, you've mentioned your prosecution clinics, right? Um, you, you said you wanted to do, you always wanted to do that. I don't know um, if you have started doing it during first uh, 1L, 2L, um, and can you walk us through how is your clinic set up? Yeah, so your first year, you pretty much just do your classes. You don't really have time to do another job or a clinic. If you think you're gonna have a part-time job your first year, like don't expect to be at the top of your class because you just can't, yeah, you don't have enough time. Um, your second year, at least at WashU, uh, you get credit for being in a clinic. And I think that's true for most schools. So it's not on top of classes, you're doing a clinic instead of some classes. Um, so like this semester, I had 16 units, two of them came from doing moot court and six of them came from doing my clinic. I was working 20 hours a week in the local prosecutor's office, um, which is a lot for six credits, but that's what I did. Uh, and then I just had three other classes on top of that. So uh, my prosecution clinic looked like going into the prosecutor's office and, looking over police reports and conducting preliminary hearings and, you know, being like a junior attorney in the office, basically, uh, except that everything you do has to be supervised, you know, by somebody else. So clinics are awesome because like I kind of said before, offhandedly, uh, you really get to like pretend that you're a lawyer. You just have somebody watching over you and making sure you're doing it right, not screwing it up. Um, a lot of clinics, you're not going into an actual office, but you're working for something public interest, um, like housing. So uh, people who have housing disputes might come to the law school seeking a student attorney to help them. Um, and you might file things on their behalf, walk them through how to submit a motion in court, um, whatever it may be. And you'll have supervisors to help you because when you start the clinic, you don't know how to do those things either. Um, but there's housing, there's usually small business stuff. Immigration is becoming a really popular topic for students to help with. Uh, like I mentioned earlier, public defender or an innocence project where you're working on appeals um, or you know somebody's first appearance in front of a, a court. Um, those are all really great places to get practical experience. And it's, in my opinion, way more fun than going to class. I think it's also more useful than going to class. Um, Cause that's another opportunity to try something out that you don't know whether you like or not. You know, you just get your credits and go <laughs> like, you know, if you hate it, you still got your credits, you're good. Um, and if you love it, now you're have networking. It's awesome on a resume. Like there's pretty much nothing that looks better on a resume. I think than a clinic or practical experience of some kind, because you're saying like I dedicated 20 hours a week you know, to doing this job already. Like I already know how to do it. Um, so please pay me. <laughs> uh, clinics are, are great. They're the best thing that you can do in law school. Um, I think no matter what area of law you're going into, it, it shows drive, it shows dedication and it shows a willingness to learn, um, which is what you're gonna have to do in any job that you go to anyway. 
Yeah, um, and, and I mean, I feel like the practical experiences that you're probably not going to get when you're a lawyer, because I feel like when you're a lawyer, you don't have time to pick and choose what area you want to go to unless I don't know if you like, you know, I know like people doing two different things, pro bono work for, you know, um, say immigration or working for the government, you know, um, but but that but that's just so cool. So you go into classes and doing clinics at the same time, you get experiences It's kind of like a, a, a mix and match and and just makes it more fun, I guess. Yeah totally yeah wow um that that those those are sounds so great and so awesome to hear um we are at the top of the hour i could sit here and talk to you <laughs> another hour or two um you're so interesting and so fun to talk to thank you so much for being here um is there any final words you would like to share with the l7 plug community and those who are going to watch the recording yeah. Um, I mean, I don't remember if I said this while it was recording or not, but the LSAT is not determinative of how well you do. You're all in an LSAT course and that's awesome. <laughs> like that's, that's really great that you have the resources and the dedication to spend time on this. I think it speaks a lot to your character, but no matter how well you do on the LSAT, whether you get a perfect score or like a 150, <laughs> it doesn't mean that you're going to be a good or a bad law student. It just it doesn't. Um, so apply the character traits that you're applying to the LSAT to your career as a law student and a lawyer. That's what's going to show through. Um, utilize the other aspects of your education and your application to boost up who you are as a person. And don't stress too much before you have to. I'd say don't stress about law school. You will once you're in law school. Um, but before then, you know, enjoy the time you have <laughs> and just be an interesting person. Like go make friends, go travel, go do other things. Because once you're in law school, so much of your time is sucked up by law school. And I'm, I'm probably like the most negative person you've ever had on these interviews, but like, I, I don't like law school and I don't think anybody likes law school and that's okay <laughs> because hopefully you're going into law school in order to do something that you're going to love. Um, so it's just three years. There are lots of good opportunities to have fun, like clinics, practical experience. Uh, if you want to hear more about those things, please come over to Life as a Law Student. Uh, I post every Saturday different videos. Sometimes it's fun stuff like touring around St. Louis, showing you my apartment or going through my closet like I did today. Uh, and sometimes it's more informative, talking about my clinical experiences or what cold calling is like or imposter syndrome. So I really hope that I will see you guys over there at Life as a Law Student sometime very soon. You can also follow me on Instagram at LAA Law Student. Um, and I really hope that I get to chat with some of you. Good luck to everyone taking the LSAT this year. Thank you so much, Nicole. It was a pleasure speaking to you and I hope we stay in touch and maybe you'll come back on another time again. Absolutely, would love to. Please email me anytime. <laughs> I will. Thank you so much and have a good night. All right. Bye. Have a good night, everyone. Thanks for tuning into the show. Please subscribe if you haven't done so already to be notified of new episodes as I release them. And feel free to reach out if you need anything at all as you move forward with your prep. I'm happy to help however I can. In the meantime, I wish you all the best and take care.